Chase has a great offer right now. There's a ton of great travel deals and some hotels got caught playing games. This and more in today's roundup. Big favor, thumbs up to help with the algorithm. If you know anyone else that might benefit, share this with them. Starting off, we have Chase with an amazing offer. There is a catch though, and it's not for everyone. Right now, they have an offer where they're offering double cash, and there's no limit on how much cash back they'll match. In the past, we saw something similar, but they only matched up to 20k in spend. In the first year, you're going to get double of the 1.5% on everything, meaning that you're getting 3% on everything. Reminder that the cash back of this card is technically points. Each $1 in cash back is equal to 100 points, and they mostly use cash back for marketing purposes to make it easier to understand. The reason I'm shocked is that it includes other categories beyond the everything else. You're getting double of 5% on travel, so 10%, double of 3% on dining and drug stores, 6%, as well as the 1.5. 10% back on travel and 6% back on dining is unheard of. Factor in that this is a no annual fee card. It feels a little too good, and with that said, there is a catch. The doubling or the matching is only for the first 12 months of your spending. Note that this product is only available if you do not have the card, and if you have not received a card member bonus for it in the last 24 months. In effect, the 2x, the doubling, is the intro bonus. The other option for the card right now is a 200 bonus after spending 500 in the first three months. Would you rather get 200 for spending 500 or doubling? In the past, it was a lot more straightforward. You basically had two offers where you put both on each side and saw for X, which is your everywhere else spend. In that case, it was about 13,000. That was the level you would need to spend to break even and ideally a lot higher. Now it's a lot more complicated due to the other categories. Assuming you were focusing on dining and keeping it super simple, you would need to spend about 6,600 for it to make sense, about 555 a month for the doubling to be better. In that sense, there's not really a right number, and I know a lot of people want to kind of anchor to something, but it's too hard here. The problem is that it's multivariable and you have way too much going on for there to be that set number. Instead, I ended up making a calculator to help you pick between the two cards. It should pop up if you Google Ask Sebi CFU Doubling Calculator. I'll put a link down below as well and feel free to share it with a friend. You put your numbers in and it'll tell you which one makes more sense for your circumstances. There are some other considerations and we'll talk about those, but baseline, this is a good offer if the numbers make sense. This is a special offer and I don't know when it ends. With that said, if you want to learn about this card or pretty much any other card out there and support the channel, we have links on the website, asksebi.com, and also down below in the description box. Make sure the offer is competitive and that the card makes sense for you, but otherwise, it is a huge way to support the channel, so thank you guys in advance. Okay, but who should go for this 2x offer? Unsurprisingly, people of high spend. So for example, if you spend a ton of drug stores for medication, then this is useful. Especially if you can put it on your own card anyways and then get reimbursed, you might as well get 6%. Same idea for a foodie and you eat out a ton, like this person in New York who spends $2,500 a month. In their case, they're getting $150 cash back every month and $1,800 per year. It's also super interesting for business owners who might have high ad spend or high inventory spend. For example, it's not uncommon to use personal cards for your own business and then file an expense report to get reimbursed. It does depend on how much you're spending though, but the CFU with that 2x, effectively 3% or 3x back on everything, can be super interesting. Some jobs might also have something similar. Back in the day, if you were a consultant, you could use your own card and then get reimbursed. If you're flying every week for consulting, then it can add up. It might also make sense for students and people that have large transactions, like for taxes. The numbers still need to make sense, but if you're paying 2.75% to make 3%, then that's an arbitrage. Same thing if you sold your business or you have some other windfall where you might owe 250K in taxes. Also, in the past few years, a lot of tech people got hit with 100K or 200K tax bills because they didn't change their withholdings during IPOs. You can pay your taxes with a credit card. There are fees, 1.85 to about 2%, but it still makes sense. That's 1.15 net. If you only care about cash back, then the juice might not be worth the squeeze, but there is a good use case for travel that we'll get into. Super fast, who should avoid the card? Number one, if you don't spend a ton. And number two, if you're willing to get a ton of cards. The break-even that we talked about earlier for dining was $5.55 a month. But what if you take that spend and apply it across multiple cards? There's a ton of cards that give you 100, 150, or 200 back for spending something like 500 in the first three months or the first 90 days of you getting the card. 555 times 12 months is about 6K, and that could easily cover six to 10 intro bonuses. If you're in the early game, you generally want to accumulate cards. I know that's not for everyone though, so your mileage may vary, but mathematically that is the move. The idea being that intro bonuses drive a lot of value and is the biggest yield. The last consideration is that the cash back is ultimate reward points. That means that if you get other chase cards in the future, or if you already have them, then the points can be worth a lot more. For example, if you have to chase Sapphire Preferred and you book travel through their portal, you get 25% more value, chase Sapphire Reserve 50% more. This is when you redeem your points for travel. We have the CFU base offer, 
doubling of the 2x, and then CSP and CSR. That means you're looking at upwards of 15x for travel, 9x for dining and drugstores, and 4.5x for everything else. Going back to the tax and tuition example, even if you're paying 3%, that might still be worth it because you're getting 4.5% here. It only works if you care about travel, but in effect, you're creating value out of nothing because you had the money anyways and you had to pay for tuition. If you care about aspirational travel, then another option is transferring to partners. Our target here is two cents per point, and there's a lot of good use cases, whether you want to fly first or business, or go to places like the Maldives, or even skiing. And I'll kind of talk about my trip or upcoming trips towards the end of the video. In that case, with a two cents per point target, you're looking at 20, 12, and 6x. Not for everyone, because there are more hoops to jump through, but this is how a lot of normal people go to exotic places. If you ever see people at these places, they're either there on point, or they're rich, or they're doing a YOLO trip and spending all their money. Super fast, but another good offer is the Chase World of Hyatt Business. My understanding is that the offer will be removed at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on October 19th, 2023. It is a lot higher spend, but the benefit of Chase Business Cards is that they don't show up in your personal credit report. The inquiry shows up, but not as a new account, so if you don't like it in the future, you can close it and there's no ill effect. 60k points after you spend 5,000 within the first three months of account opening, and then an additional 15k points after you spend a total of $12,000, so an additional 7,000 within the first six months of account opening. Hyatt points have a ton of value, whether you're focused on economy travel and road trip style stays, or if you care about aspirational stuff. Given that our target is two cents per point and there's a ton of value. Tranche number one, 60k points times two cents per point is 1200 value divided by 5,000 in spend is 24% return on spend. Tranche number two is 300 in value for 7,000 in additional spend, so 4.3% return on spend. First one makes a ton of sense, second one might be worth skipping, but depends on you. We did do a deep dive on this card on the business channel and it might be worth watching if you're concerned about value outside of the intro bonus and keeping it into year two and onwards. All right, let's move into a lightning round. Chase has a 25% bonus when you transfer to Flying Blue, which is Air France and KLM. Normally it's one to one, and now it's one to 1.25. 100K UR is 125K Flying Blue. Offer does end November 30th, 2023, and we have seen this in the past, so if you don't have a specific use case, I probably would not transfer. It's not bad by any means, but I wouldn't lock it up if you don't have a use. Next one is Clear, which has a pretty good promo, where you get a $75 Uber credit for signing up. Promo code is claim Uber 75 If you have a card that comes up with this credit, then kind of a double win. Last year, we saw something similar and it was fine, and it took about eight days for them to get the voucher. Your mileage may vary in case it changes for this year, but it should be fine. Note that we have seen other versions of this in the past, so $100 United Travel Bank, 15 k United, and those might be better. If you're comfortable flying United, then I'd probably go for those ones. Marriott has a promo called Eat Around Town, where you can earn extra points. The spend numbers seem pretty reasonable at just 30 bucks, so if you're eating anyways, then it works. The more annoying part is that you do need to complete a restaurant review within 30 days of visiting each restaurant. You also cannot opt out of their emails. Initially, that sounded like way too much work, but then I realized you could automate it. Here's a review for a burger place that I liked that was yummy yummy in my tummy. IXG has a substantially easier promotion. So if you register, you're going to earn 2,000 bonus points for every two nights through December 31st, 2023. If you are looking for something that's a bit more substantive, then consider Moomoo, Moo, where you can get up to 16 free stocks. They have three different levels. The easiest is depositing $100 to get five free stocks. You can deposit 900 more to get 10 additional stocks. Reminder that Moomoo Moo is a registered broker-dealer and a member of SIPC. This means that you're covered for up to 500k, including 250k for cash. Link down below if you want to get up to 16 free stocks. Last deal was Delta, and these are some surprisingly good rates. These are for economy travel, but I feel like I don't talk enough about economy deals, and this is one. Also, I know a lot of people don't like Delta right now, so either way, you might as well use their points. Flying from the US to Auckland, it's 54k points for round trip. It's even cheaper if you have a Delta card due to the 15% discount, so about 46,000 points. Sydney at 70,000 or 56,000 sounds pretty good as well, and same thing with Tokyo at the same rates. Tahiti's okay, but it's not the best time to visit, so I probably wouldn't do that one unless you have a trip booked. These should show up if you look for round trip, and the dates are pretty decent. So availability is open from November 2023 to March 2024. For places like Sydney and Auckland, that's their summer and fall. Generally when you want to go. It is winter in Japan and it gets pretty cold, but if you're into skiing, then it's perfect. Also, in case you're curious about my skiing redemptions for 2024, I'll cover that towards the end. The last story is Hyatt and how they're playing games with availability. A lot of places don't like you using points and end up locking it off for various reasons. So number one, maybe they won't let you do one night. You have to do maybe two, three, or four. Number two, they won't have as many standard rooms. And number three, they'll kind of make a very specific type of room, their standard room, meaning that there's not a lot of them. 
And it's not just Hyatt, it's across the board, but Hyatt did get caught with their pants down. The Hyatt centric in Hawaii created a fake room category so that only 20 rooms on the property would be considered standard. In addition, you would also need to have a three night minimum stay. Ironically, even Hyatt wasn't happy with this, and this is one time where complaining works. Carissa Rawson wrote a pretty scathing review of this practice. After publishing, Hyatt did end up addressing this, and they ended up increasing space by 20 times. The funny thing is that this practice wasn't even allowed by Hyatt. There's Hyatt Corporate, which wants to set certain guidelines and expectations for visitors. There's the actual Hyatt Hotels, which might not be owned by Hyatt, which might be owned by someone else, and they kind of want to cut costs, they want to make more money. Imagine a McDonald's that doesn't serve certain items because they know it's not profitable, or maybe where the ice cream machine's always broken. And to be fair, this still does happen in other hotels. I'm not a fan, but I'd rather jump through hoops and deal with these little rules than paying the retail price out of pocket. A good example of this is Alila Ventana Big Sur, which is a great redemption, but they make you do at least two nights on the weekends. And I get it because if all the Friday nights are booked and it's only Saturday, some people might not bother with the drive. They'd rather lock in someone for two nights rather than you for one night and hope that someone takes that other night. We also just ran into this because we booked a lot of ski stuff for 2024. We ended up booking Park Hyatt Naseko, which had a minimum night requirement, and it's still a good redemption and great value, so I'll happily jump through the hoops. Locking in two to three cents per point for something I want to do anyways makes a ton of sense. We also ended up adding the Ritz-Carlton that's nearby for the trip because we might as well if we're all the way over there. The value is a bit worse and only near my target valuation, but still fine. It's a long trip, so might as well do both. Flying from SFO to Tokyo is 11 hours, and then Tokyo to Sapporo is 2 hours. That's not even the end of it, we're not even there. You then have to take a 2 hour car ride, or a substantially longer public transit ride, to get to the property. All of this while we have our ski gear, and if we're gonna do that anyways, might as well go to the Ritz. Also, we really want to drink a Sapporo and Sapporo, so there's that. It sounds a lot cooler in my head, but probably isn't as interesting in real life. Again, if you want to learn about cards, we have links on the website, asksebi.com, and down below in the description box. If you made it to this point in the video, then leave a beer emoji in the comments down below, and I'll try to heart it and also respond. A few questions for you guys. Number one, what are your thoughts on the CFU double offer to 2x offer? Number two, any other deals that you're taking advantage of? And number three, any trips you're booking in any other hotels that you don't like playing games? Let me know and everyone else know in the comments down below. I feel like it's always the expensive, busy hotels, but it still makes sense. Big favorite, thumbs up, share this with a friend, but otherwise, hope you liked it. See you next time.